Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. If you are watching this video, please let me know if there is still uh, a, 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 the synchronization of the volume and the video, if there is a problem in it. In the past week or two, there was a technical problem. I tried to fix it both through software and through hardware. And I would like to know today if this live streaming is going well and my voice fits my uh, speaking, my uh, my lips, let's say. So there is no lips and the synchronization is working. Please let me know in the comments below so that I can also know if this one is working well. What are we going to talk? Okay, sounds has a crackle. Okay, synchronized, but with static. Some people say it's playing well. Some people um, say there are some uh, issues with the volume. So I don't know which one is correct right now. But can you hear me well? If you do, I will start today's uh, live streaming is uh, about the recent escalation in Ukraine. And uh, as you may know, guys, when the Russian offensive started in February 2022, uh, Ukraine uh, was uh, supposed to win this war, right? And this was the narrative that uh, was uh, sold to us all that Ukraine will win this war against the superpower and against the uh, nuclear power. And unfortunately for Ukraine, Ukraine lost territories in the first few months. There were some skirmishes from here or there. Ukraine pushed the Ukrainian forces in some of the accesses, but uh, all in all, if you see the uh, map of control over Ukraine, Russia has conquered large swath of territories from Ukraine. And uh, then they absorbed it, right? The Russians absorbed these territories into the Russian Federation through the referendums in different regions in, in Ukraine. And then the narrative was that uh, we have to wait for the counteroffensive of Ukraine. Just wait for the counteroffensive and the counteroffensive will turn the table upside down. We waited for the counteroffensive for uh, too long and it was delayed multiple times. And the counteroffensive against the uh, a superpower which established three to four big defensive lines uh, against the Ukrainian forces. And this is considered the most mined region territory in the entire world. And Ukraine went to this counteroffensive or pushed to this counteroffensive without enough artillery power or air superiority. And I have been myself talking about this, and I, I was called a pessimist, a Putinist, and the Kremlin propagandist for saying, how can Ukraine go to this counteroffensive without uh, enough artillery power and without air superiority? It's impossible, right? So the question here is, has Ukraine gone to this counteroffensive with its full conviction or somebody pushed Ukraine to go to this um, uh, to this counteroffensive? So the result was a complete failure. Tens of thousands of uh, more Ukrainians uh, perished. So easy enough to understand, can ignore the mi minor static. I don't know what's happening with the uh, with the volume, guys, because everything is on my side is working well, and I can see that uh, the uh, the sensitivity of the volume that is um, working from from my side. I will try to check it later again. So 
after all these failures, we are talking about tens of thousands of casualties, right? And instead of uh, coming to their senses and end this meat grinder for the Ukrainians, we have now new escalation in Ukraine. And this time from the UK side. The UK side is, we, we don't speak much about the UK. We always focus on the United States. But in my opinion, the UK is involved as much as the United States in this war. And they are uh, enthusiastic as much as the establishment in the United States for this war, because for them, is this also an existential threat for the Anglo-American empire. So Britain seeks to train military inside Ukraine, the UK defense chief says. Britain is, Britain is in talks to move more training and production of military equipment into Ukraine, UK defense secretary Grant Shapps said he was appointed only, I think, two, three months ago. Shapps said he had been, quote, talking about talking today about eventually getting the training brought closer and actually into Ukraine as well, particularly in the west of the country. I think the opportunity now is to bring more things in country and not just training, but also we are seeing UK defense firm BAE for example, move into manufacturing in countries. So not only they want to train the Ukrainian forces inside Ukraine, because currently there are different military camps in the UK, in Germany, and in other European countries. They are training the Ukrainians on using the NATO armaments and training them to fight against the Russian forces. But also they want to send manufacturers, factories into Ukraine so that they can establish manufacturers and factories there to produce more weaponry and they can deliver. Uh, so for the supply chain and the supply lines would be faster for Ukraine, right? So. The UK and other NATO count, uh, uh, members have so far avoided setting up a military presence in Ukraine to reduce the risk of a direct conflict between the Defense Alliance and Russia. But apparently, this could change very soon as Britain may be going to send its uh, boots on the ground to train quote-unquote, the Ukrainian forces and also produce weapons. Dmitry Medvedev, who is the former president of uh, Russian Federation, this is also something that I also want to, uh, um, to speak about. And I was always telling my friends, like, uh, be careful what you wish for, because some of the uh, pro-Ukrainian friends they were telling me that Putin is very radical. And I was telling them, beware of what you wish for, because if there was another personality, for example, like Medvedev, the escalation from the Russian side or the retaliation and the escalation from the Russian side would have been also very brutal, different from what we are seeing nowadays. And there are different circles of power in Russia. Some of them are critical of Putin telling, uh, telling us and also in public that uh, Putin is too soft in his uh, dealing with the NATO escalation. And then we can see hot heads like Dmitry Medvedev, and he goes on Twitter, and this is what he says. The number of idiots in power in NATO countries is growing. One newly minted moron, the British Secretary of State for Defense, decided to move the UK military training of Ukrainian soldiers into Ukraine. That is to turn the British military instructors into our armed forces, quote, legal targets while being fully aware that they will be ruthlessly eliminated, and this time not as mercenaries, but as British NATO specialists. He also fires some bullets uh, through his statements on Germany. He says, another fool from Bundestag, the chairwoman of German Defense Committee with an unpronounceable surname, is clamoring to immediately provide the Ukrobandovtsi, so it means Ukraine, with Taurus missiles to enable the Kiev regime to hit deep into Russia's territory to weaken the supply of our army. That is, it is, it is in accordance with international law. Well, in that case, the strikes against the German plants which produce these missiles will also fully correspond to international law. Really, these half wits are actively pushing us toward World Three. So, what did the uh, UK side. How did the UK side react to this? Because the UK side was quick to uh, tone down. And I think it is just a temporary tone down. At the end of the day, they will go for an escalation, in my opinion, in, in Ukraine. And they will send instructors or trainers there. So the Prime Minister of, U, uh, of the UK, Sunak, he said that there, there are no plans for now, for now, so this is the important part of this statement. For now, there is no plan to send British troops to Ukraine. 
He said there are no immediate plans to deploy military instructors to Ukraine, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said on Sunday, rolling back from comments by his defense minister who had suggested troops could carry out training in the country. To this date, Britain and its allies have avoided a formal military presence in Ukraine to reduce the risk of a direct conflict with Russia. There are two things we have to focus here, guys, in the statement, like no plans for now, which I believe it will be developed into plan for the future. And secondly, they say to this date, Britain and its allies have avoided a former military presence in Ukraine, which I believe that they already have a presence in Ukraine, whether through the mercenaries that are coming from the ex-special forces, former special forces, or former Marine Corps veterans, and all these people who uh, flooded the uh, Ukrainian territories to fight against the Russians. In my opinion, those were sent by uh, the Pentagon or the CIA or the MI6 to carry the fighting in Ukraine against the Russians. Quote, he said, what the defense secretary was saying was that it might well be possible one day in the future for us to do something of that training in Ukraine, Sunak told the reporters. But that's something for the long term, not the here and now. There are no British soldiers that will be sent to fight in the current conflict. So as I told you guys, at the moment, there may not be soldiers from the British side, but I do believe that there will be forces soon to train the Ukrainians, especially in the Western side. But against who Dmitry Medvedev was firing his bullets in Germany? This is the woman that he, he was talking about. The German official says Ukraine has right to launch missiles on Russian territory. So uh, the, the, the entire argument here is, guys, that uh, the, <clears throat> the chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, he refused to send these Taurus missiles to Ukraine and he wants to make modifications on the missile software modifications so that they cannot hit the Russian targets inside of Russia, but inside of Ukraine, it, which means the to minimize the um, uh, to minimize the uh, what to say the the range of these uh, missiles, right? The range uh, of these uh, Taurus missiles are 500 kilometer, so they wanted to make to to convert it into 200 kilometers, so that the so that the Ukrainians cannot hit Russian targets inside of Russia, but inside of Ukraine. But this Marie Agnes struck Zimmerman. She is the chair of the defense committee at the German Bundestag. She has urged the German government to give long-range Taurus missiles to Ukraine because she believes that Ukraine has the right to attack targets on the territory of the Russian Federation. So she said that the Ukrainian army can deploy Taurus missiles to severely disrupt Russian missile logistics. She added it was time to recognize that Kiev has the right to launch missiles to strike targets on the territory of Russia, which is here, in my opinion, this is the dangerous part because Chancellor Olaf Scholz, he doesn't want this. He wants to reduce the uh, radius or the how long can these missiles can be fired. And this struck Zimmerman. She wants to send the Taurus missile the way they are. So accordingly, eventually, this could end up on Russian territories. She also says international law also allows Ukraine to attack military targets on the territory of the Russian aggressor, regardless of where these weapons were produced and who supplied them. Zimmerman also warned German Chancellor Olaf Scholz against further delays in sending missiles to Ukraine after six months of discussions. Each of us has weighed everything up to decide whether to supply Taurus missiles to Ukraine, but delaying it would not only prolong suffering, she explained. This is, of course, a very crazy statement uh, from this woman, and it's coming from the Free Democratic Party, the FDP, and they consider themselves uh, a center-right party. And they came to power uh, as as if they were opposition, uh, because they were opposition in the past. And uh, when they reach to power, they're uh, they're scoring very very low now at the moment, and the people aren't happy with the FDP or the Greens or the Social Democrats. And these people, in my opinion, they do not uh, do enough calculations of how this could end up. First of all, I don't believe that they are uh, intellectually and experience-wise are ready to understand how this conflict could end up or where it could end up. Because um, these people, if if something happens here in Germany, they, they will be on the first plane escaping with them or their family or hiding in the bunker. So the rest of the people will pay the price. This is my conviction. I do not think that anyone with... Uh, 
some sanity or belonging to this country in Germany would do something like this, sending a sort of a weaponry that could be hit, that could be fired on Russian territories. If you want to support Ukraine, send them defensive uh, weaponry, right? So let the Ukrainians defend themselves. And also the other point is the Taurus missiles have to be carried on F-16. So how many F-16s are you going to send to Ukraine? That's the other question. And the third question is, how many Taurus missiles will you send? And how many Taurus missiles can be game changer? Because every time we see in the media that there, it's, a, it's a game changer, everything is a game changer. Small rifles are a game changer. Rockets are a game changer. Anti-tank missiles are a game changer. Leopards are a game changer. Challengers are a game changer. The howitzers are a game changer. Heimars are game changers. And now this is the supposed game changer. So how many of them will be can be considered a game changer because in my information that I saw, which is a public information, that Germany has around 100 of these missiles ready to be um, sent to Ukraine, right? So do you, do you think that 100 Taurus missiles can change the equation in, 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 in Ukraine? Is it a, a game changer? No, of course not. So why are they doing it? Are they? Do they have links to the military industrial complex? Are they getting profits from selling this weaponry? Those are legitimate questions, in my opinion, before addressing this case. But nobody wants to ask these very important and basic questions. Scott Ritter, who is a former U.S. Marine veteran, uh, intelligence uh, officer, sorry, and also UN uh, inspector, weapons inspector, he posted this very scary, in my opinion, tweet. And I do not endorse it, of course. And it is very, uh, it's a scary times, right? He says the German parliament is green lighting the transfer of Taurus air launched cruise missiles to Ukraine for the express purpose of striking Russian soil. The United States would never stand for another nation providing a weapon to an enemy intended to strike American soil. This is up until this moment is correct. Like imagine Russia sending uh, weapons to any hostile country up for the United States, and uh, these weapons could be reached to the United States. We would blow the fuck out of the providing nation. It's time Russia, he says, blows the fuck out of Germany. Of course, I do not endorse this. German people have nothing to do with this. The German people are suffering just like any other people here, financially, economically, and they do not endorse it. And the polls and the numbers show, the statistics show, also the American people, most of the American people do not want to send more weaponry. And this is, was also acknowledged on CNN. And, and also here, the polls show that uh, the people do not want to uh, continue supporting this uh, and carry the financial burden, and especially in a way that this could end up into direct confrontation between Russia and Germany. He says, Germany cannot be allowed to hide behind NATO's nuclear umbrella. I'm in favor of peace unless all the other side wants is war. Germans seem to have forgotten what war with Russia means. Maybe it's time for Russia to remind them. This is a very scary, in my opinion, treat. As I mentioned, I do not endorse it. I live in Germany myself. And um, the last thing I would want for, for Germany and for the Germans, regardless if I live here or not, is uh, a, an escalation of this type that could, that will not end here. You know, if such escalation happens, there is going to be World War III, which means millions of people will perish. There, in If we, in World War II, there was a conventional, only conventional armaments killed around 60 million people, then imagine what could the situation be if World War III happens with nuclear weapons? How many people are they going to die? 600 million? A billion people? Two billion people? Do these people understand what they are talking about? Do this so-called Zimmerman knows what is, she what is she talking about? Or they're, they, they're just following uh, their ideological understanding for this war and trying to pocket money? I don't understand, right? This was just in September uh, of this year when Annalena Bebok was in Kiev and uh, uh, the foreign minister of uh, Ukraine was asked about the Taurus missiles. And this was his answer. It was humiliating. It was patronizing. It was... Uh, uh, he humiliated Annalena Bebok in any way. So let's take a look first what he said. Okay. Uh, now, in the midst of the counteroffensive unfolding, uh, especially on the Southern Front, do you feel that you could or do you wish for more support from your Western allies with regard to, say, Taurus and, um, yeah, also F-16? Do you think it should, should all be quicker and faster? Well, first, if the 
translation was correct, and I know that the interpreter is very professional. You asked Annalena whether she gave me any hope about Taurus. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that uh, Annalena went beyond the official position of the German government, but um, you know, you will you will do it anyway. It's just a matter of time, and I don't understand why we're wasting time. And we could have uh, achieved uh, more and uh, save more lives of Ukrainian soldiers and civilians if we already had towers. And all we are asking the German, we are telling the German government, we respect your discussions, we respect your procedures, but from everything we know about Taurus, there is not a single objective argument against not doing it. Uh, you have some questions. We are ready to answer these questions positively. Let's do it. The sooner it happens, the more it will be appreciated. It's very simple. So this was the uh, response of the Ukrainian uh, foreign minister, which in my opinion was patronizing her. And she didn't say anything. She was patronized by him and she is uh, a champion of uh, feminism and if anyone disrespects a woman she would be the first going ballistic against him but in this in this case she didn't say anything and it was embarrassing in my opinion for her to just stand there like a little child you know she would have even if it's your ally you shouldn't treat your ally that way and um, the other day i was watching a video of uh, mp from the uh, afd or uh, afd in german uh, they say and the mp is from uh, as i mentioned from the afd his name is marcus von meyer marcus von meyer he is criticizing the foreign minister of uh, Germany, which is, in my opinion, interesting to see that uh, such a uh, speech is happening under the Bundestag. He says, today I have to say it very clearly, uh, Ms. Bebo is the greatest danger to German foreign uh, policy since 1949. The fourth largest industrial power in the world really deserves better. Let's take a look. Frau Präsidentin, meine Damen und Herren, wir sprechen heute über die China-Strategie von Annalena Baerbock. Frau Baerbock, Sie haben in Ihrer kurzen Amtszeit wirklich viel Erstaunliches erreicht. Sie haben Dinge erreicht, die andere deutsche Außenminister vor Ihnen nicht erreicht haben. Sie haben beispielsweise über Länder philosophiert, die hunderttausende Kilometer entfernt liegen. Das Jahr hat für Sie 560 Tage. Sie haben Südafrika als Schinken der Hoffnung, Bacon of Hope gelobt. Sie haben in finnischen Bunkeranlagen Hüpfspiele veranstaltet. Sie haben bei der Münchner Sicherheitskonferenz Wladimir Putin zu einer 360-Grad-Wende aufgefordert. Und Sie haben einfach mal so im Nebensatz Russland den Krieg erklärt. Das wäre alles irgendwie unterhaltsam. Das wäre alles irgendwie RTL 2, wenn Sie nur eine einfache Grünen-Politikerin wären. Aber das sind Sie nicht. Sie sind die Außenministerin der viertgrößten Industriemacht der Welt, der Erde. Und ich muss Ihnen sagen, Deutschland hat wirklich Besseres verdient. Und in Anknüpfung an diese zahlreichen Ausfälle diskutieren wir heute über die China-Strategie der Bundesregierung. Und das diplomatische Gespür gegenüber China, das konnten wir jetzt erst jüngst wieder erleben, als Sie bei Fox News den chinesischen Präsidenten einen Diktator nannten. Und damit wir uns an der Stelle nicht falsch verstehen, wir wollen keine innerchinesischen Verhältnisse in Deutschland. Nein, aber vielleicht wollen die Chinesen auch keine innerdeutschen Verhältnisse in China, meine Damen und Herren. Den größten Handelspartner so vor den Kopf zu stoßen, das ist im besten Fall unklug, im schlimmsten Fall gefährlich. Und darum muss man das heute, glaube ich, mal ganz klar sagen. Sie sind die größte Gefahr für die deutsche Außenpolitik seit 1949. Schauen wir uns das Papier doch mal an. Bisher ist niemand konkret auf den Inhalt eingegangen. Auf Seite 12 steht, wir sollen mit China einen intensiven Dialog über den Kohleausstieg führen. 
Glauben Sie ernsthaft, dass China auf Kohlekraftwerke verzichtet, nur weil sie diese ausschalten? Auf Seite 15 steht, dass wir China zu mehr Schuldenschnitten für hochverschuldete Staaten animieren sollen. Kollege, schreien Sie nicht so. Wir müssen das jeden Tag im Fernsehen ertragen, was Ihre Regierung und diese Außenministerin abzieht. Und ich muss Ihnen wirklich sagen, das ist nicht vergnügungssteuerpflichtig. Meine Damen und Herren, auf Seite 15 steht dann übrigens auch, dass wir mit China über entwaldungsfreie Lieferketten verhandeln sollen. Diese China-Strategie, das ist eine deutsche Version vom großen Sprung nach vorn. Statt aber Spatzen zu jagen, lieber Kollege, jagen Sie auch von der FDP grünen Fantasien hinterher, meine Damen und Herren. So, this was the speech of a uh, member of parliament, uh, the federal parliament, Markus von Meyer. It was uh, subtitled to English so that uh, we can understand also that there is an opposition in Germany against the government policies, not only uh, the policies uh, against Russia, but also against uh, China. And this is coming mostly from the alternative uh, for Germany party. In German, they say uh, AFD. And this party is uh, considered or framed by the German uh, mainstream media as uh, far right, neo Nazis, fascists, etc., etc. The same playbook, in my opinion, to silence any opposition to the government or the establishment policies. And they are even discussing banning this uh, political party, which is, in my opinion, will be a huge blow to the uh, German democracy. I rule out that possibility for now. But for, for since we're talking about the AFD, they started in 2013 as a very small political party. They had 2-3%. It was uh, Their discussion was mostly about the refugee crisis and also the, um, the they wanted to exit the EU. And then because of the refugee crisis that hit the country in 2014 and 15 and 16, they have surged and they have entered the parliament in uh, 2017 with, I think, 11-12%. And now their numbers are around 22%. And this is a very big number. They are the second uh, most strong party, political party in Germany. And if the uh, the situation stays the way it is, which means the socioeconomic situation the way it is, in the next election in 2025, yeah, 2025, they, they could come to power. And uh, if they come to power and they want to restore the North Sea pipelines and they want to end the support for Ukraine and etc., I think I think the United States will go ballistic against them and they will consider them a hostile entity and they will I think they will try to eliminate them before they come to power if they pose a serious threat to that. So this is I found a really very very good uh, video actually by Mike Benz. I don't know if Mike is German because his surname is Benz and he probably. Has have some German roots, and he says, uh, because there was a clash between Elon Musk and the uh, foreign ministry of Germany on Twitter, and he says, here is why they're coming after you in what must look like an absurd side attack around some obscure upstart political party in Germany, the AFD. He says, the AFD wants cheap Russian gas, massive threat to Biden world plus BlackRock's grand Ukraine energy play. So there is another aspect that he's explaining here that they don't want for the AFD to come because they, the, if AFD comes to power, they will pose a threat to the liquefied natural gas companies and the BlackRock and the, the, the big strategy of the Biden and his son in Ukraine to send this gas and oil to Europe through their pipelines with very high prices instead of buying the cheap Russian gas. Take a look. Hey, I'm making this video about Germany's AFD party on the off chance that Elon Musk sees this. There's a whole sort of geopolitical intrigue around the German AFD party that nobody really is privy to unless you study the blob, you know, the, the US foreign policy blob around the State Department, the Defense Department, and the IC that you just have to know about because so much about internet censorship, the history of it comes out of this attempt to quell this party and related movements all over Europe. So the German AFD party, and, and by the way, just as a backstory, I just saw that Elon Musk got accused by somebody of you know, being like a sympathizer for this party, the AFD alternative for Deutschland. It's a populist party in, in Germany. And Elon Musk responded that he didn't know AFD from a hole in the ground. And so here, let's cover that hole. 
So when the migrant crisis popped off in Europe, 2013, 2015, that is what gave rise to this whole right-wing populist movement in Europe. The Brexit vote in the UK, Marine Le Pen, a populist party on the right in France, Matteo Salvini in Italy, the Vox party in Spain, the Greek National Party in Greece, and its iteration essentially in Germany was something called the Alternative for Deutschland, AFD. And you know the knock on them is that they're racist or they're anti-Semitic or hate speech or misogynist or anti, they, have, they, they try to hit them with these hate speech predicates for a long time for wanting to basically close the border uh, in, into Europe. But that's not what's going on here. You have to understand just like this hate speech predicate is almost never what they say it is. There's almost always a geopolitical reason and they're shoehorning it in to create a censorship predicate to kill their popularity online and thus kill them as a politically viable institution since they don't have mainstream media support. It's all about the LNG, okay? Liquefied natural gas, the gas market, okay? That's the story of AFD. That's the story of the State Department's involvement, the Biden family's involvement, and the entire internet censorship starting, Europe all grew out of, okay, let me take a step back. In 2016, when the, when Trump won the election on November 8th, 2016, all these State Department people uh, thought they were all going to get promotions when Hillary Clinton won the election to, uh, to join, join basically the National Security Council in the White House. They all thought they were going to get promoted because Hillary was going to win. Instead, the 90 to 10 underdog Trump ends up winning and they all get fired. So they, this, this State Department network had just done a roadshow in Europe to, to, to be the sanctions coordinators to get all the European countries to sanction Europe after the Crimea annexation in 2014. So from 2014 to 2016, they were all up on Europe to, to get them to cut their own legs off to sanction Russia. When they lost the 2016 election, and the Brexit vote also happened just months earlier, they did that same dirty diplomats cabal roadshow to Europe, but this time, instead of getting them to do sanctions, to get them to do censorship. And this culminated in August 2017 with the passage in Germany of something called Nets DG. Nets DG was this sprawling, first of its kind, Western world internet censorship law that effectively required artificial intelligence content moderation to take down speech within 48 hours or else face a $54 million penalty from, from uh, the German government for doing this. So if you, if, if Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Reddit and anyone wanted to do business in Germany, they had to have AI censorship techniques implemented on their platforms. Okay. That's the origin of that. And that wasn't Germany's idea. That was a U.S. State Department, U.K. foreign office operation. And one of the things you have to understand is the grand Ukraine energy play here is, is you know, all the, all the Russian gas that used to come into Europe, it used to be a hundred percent of the natural gas. Now it's down to like, well, until recently, it was down to like 35% because of a decade and a half of energy diversification, basically strong arm diplomacy that was done. But the, the whole play was if you privatize Ukraine's assets, their gas assets, particularly NAFTA gas, the state gas company, but then all the little private ones like Burisma, you get them in Wall Street and London stakeholder hands. So you take a, the, the publicly held nut you know, the, the, the entire revenue generator of Ukraine, which is the transit point for, for the Russian gas, if you privatize it so that it's, it's U.S. State Department essentially profits, or the stakeholders, but it's no longer held by the government now, it's privately held by us, but then you kill Gazprom and, and force imports of Houston LNG or Shell LNG in London, you run it through through ports either in Spain, Portugal, or Poland, which became the big one. They, they connected the the uh, network in Poland so that you could ship in through the, through the Baltic and then just keep the same gas transit architecture into central Europe from there, then, then you would have hundreds of billions of windfall profits because you become the monopoly supplier by, by kicking out the cheap Russian gas, which is, which is orders of magnitude cheaper than having to ship it across the Atlantic Ocean coming from the Permian Basin. The problem is AFD, the, this German populist party, 
is a workers' party. It's a workers' movement. It's a lower and, and lower middle class uh, movement of, of people who, you know, one of their planks, just like with the MAGA movement in, in the U.S. and just like with Marine Le Pen's in France and the whole litany, is that the energy prices were insane. The cost of living was too high. Russia was offering cheap gas. So just we got these Nord Stream pipeline, the second Nord Stream pipeline coming online. They, they wanted this, this cheap energy from Russia. And that fucked over the entire State Department grand Ukraine energy play and all what the stakeholders had been banking on for a decade before that, especially in, in 2014, 2015. BlackRock made a huge move into LNG. Hunter Biden was personally nut riding the entire in, like industry ecosystem. He was on the board of Burisma, along with Cover Black, former 30 years at the CIA. That whole Devon Archer, the whole Biden family corruption is about the LNG market. And that only happens if Russia's kicked out. And AFD, they're being called, though, hate speech, hate speech, has nothing to do with that. It's the cold, hard cash of the LNG market. That's what it's all about. And you can read up on the Integrity Initiative documents where they plotted this whole thing secretly. Ann Applebaum, Ben Nimmo, Peter Pomerantsev, Bill Browder, that whole network, so much was dedicated to the fact that AFD was crushing it in the polls. And if they won, then it kills the entire grand Ukraine energy play. So, so, so everything that you're seeing around this, because understand Germany is the industrial powerhouse of Europe, okay? If they turn populist, then, then the entire foothold goes. So that's why they're going after Elon Musk on this. And Elon Musk doesn't necessarily, I don't blame him for not knowing, you know, AFD for, from a hole in the ground. But the reason they're coming at him from this angle is because that's the center of the op in Europe. Boom, in my opinion, boom. This is one of the reasons why there is a war in Ukraine. And we have spoken about the Nord Stream pipelines on this channel extensively. And I told you the United States blew up the Nord Stream pipelines. There is no one behind this except the United States in order to sell the liquefied natural gas to Europe themselves with the very high prices. And now the people are paying the price here, right? So if this narrative is correct, because there is always a chance that I'm not correct, right? If I'm correct, let's say, how do you evaluate the, the politicians in Germany who are not serving the interests of their own country and their own people? Why, as me, as a politician, would work in the interest for the interests of another country and not for the interests of my country and for my people? What do I gain personally? What do you think, guys? What, why, what do these politicians gain? Are they gaining something financial? Are they gaining something prestigious? What are they gaining politically, financially? What is the gain here? If we can, like, okay, the data speaks for itself, right? The biggest loser of this war is Ukraine on, on the casualties level, economic level, military level. The second biggest loser for this war in terms of the finances, financially, economically, is Germany. So the data speaks for itself. And we know that the uh, strikes against the North Sea pipelines have harmed Germany. And we know that prolonging this war harms Germany. And we know that the strategy of the United States is to draw a line in Ukraine so that Germany and Russia cannot have economic integration together because this poses a great threat on the supremacy of the U.S. over, over Europe. And this will end any need for Germany to be in NATO. We have spoken about this extensively on Syrian analysis, right? But what do the politicians who are now in power and they are calling for more escalation and more weapons to Ukraine and they are happy with this liquefied natural gas and they don't want to buy gas from uh, Russia, etc., etc.? What do they gain? Please let me know in the comments below. I would like to read this stuff. I just want to give a chance to Rafael. He says, thank you for the work and perspective. Is there another way uh, to support the channel than Patreon? Yes, guys. Uh, there are different mean means in the description below. You can become... Uh, a premium member, you can become a patron, you can uh, simply uh, help, uh, support me through PayPal, or uh, if you're from the United States, I am also an affiliate marketer 
of uh, vitamin D uh, product. Uh, you can see also the link in the description below. You will not pay any penny extra. I will just get my 10% uh, commission from the profits of this vitamin. This is vitamin uh, D3, K2, which is something, the, uh, a supplement that helps you to... Uh, to immunize, uh, to support your immune system. This doesn't replace your immune system. You need to eat healthy. You need to practice, guys. But the vitamin D3, K2 is very essential for boosting your immune system. I, myself, I take it regularly. I take 20,000 units per four days because I live in Berlin and it's not uh, as sunny as other countries. So um, if, if we want to speak about the... Uh, the continue about the AFD here and something also uh, another crazy thing that happened that they're trying to silence this party right and whether you agree with them or not but there is uh, an attempt to silence them so uh, uh, Tino Trupala he's the co-leader of the conservative AFD party announced this week that he had been debanked by Deutsche Bank for his association with the party. This year, the German Institute for Human Rights, a major state-funded think tank, and the influential magazine Der Spiegel called for the banning of the AFD as, quote, enemies of the constitution. The German president also suggested his support for banning the party. This comes at a time when AFD is at record popularity. A poll this week showed that the AFD is within one point of being tied for the largest party in Germany. 78 Percent of Germans believe integration of immigrants into German society is not working well. 80% of Germans believe the German state is failing in its duty to deport failed migrants. Despite this, the number of asylum seekers into Germany continues to increase on record levels. And now the regime is working to destroy one of the most popular political movements in the country, all in a nation held up as a model for liberal democracy. I don't think that the uh, the scores of the AFD are surging because of the only the migrants or the refugee crisis. This is one of the reasons, of course. Mostly it's about the socioeconomic situation and the huge burden that the people are carrying because of the Ukraine war and also the uh, incompetence, I would say, some of the politicians in Germany. And uh, Germany... Uh, unfortunately lost its uh let's say the pride right like no like there are so many countries around the world are now disrespecting germany because of the politicians who are not uh for example annalena bebok when she was uh, disrespected by the ukrainian foreign minister she she just swallowed it at the same time she declared war on russia and then uh, she uh, backtracked her statement she said i didn't say that and uh, she's making a very i would say ridiculous mistakes in in the in terms of verbal mistakes like she cannot form sentences whether in german or in english and she's making uh, uh, diplomatic mistakes and at the same time all this war in ukraine apparently lots of people are waking up to the reality that it, it cannot be uh, Ukraine cannot win this war so why are we sending all this money from the taxpayer money right like I am myself I'm paying taxes and I'm, it's going to Ukraine and we know that millions hundreds of millions of uh, dollars were have been pocketed by the defense minister by the chief of staff by Zelensky himself and Ukraine is the most corrupt country in Europe this was before the war. Now imagine after the war what would have happened in, in Ukraine. So this is a huge money laundering operation, guys. And Zelensky is the head of the money laundering um, operation. Uh, or let's say he is the uh, agent of the money laundering operation in Ukraine, representative of the money laundering operation there. He's not the head. I think the head of the money laundering operation is in the United States. It's in BlackRock. It's in Vanguard. And all these very wealthy um corporations that worth trillions of dollars and the other day i was wondering like if they if they are destroying ukraine to reconstruct it quote unquote and then blackrock comes and uh, gets an exclusive contracts to rebuild ukraine then they're owning ukraine right they are private corporations and private individuals they have so much influence over the foreign policy of the united states that they can push the country into war or send other countries into war as proxy and then the country is destroyed and they come and they come as a helping hand and they say that we are here to help you 
and that's how they own the country. And I was wondering, was it probably this is one of the reasons why they destroyed my country, Syria, that they wanted to destroy Syria and then rebuild it, quote unquote, because they thought Assad will leave. And then when Assad stayed, he refused to give these contracts to these uh, corporations, right? And he's like, no, I will give it to China, I will give it to Iran, I will give it to Russia, I will give it to my allies. That is why they are imposing draconian sanctions on the Syrian people against the Syrian economy, so they don't allow reconstruction. It makes sense if you think about it, right? But because they are trying now to, uh, they did uh, debank Tino Trupula. He didn't do commit any war, any war crime. He didn't commit any war crime. He didn't c commit any crime. Uh, in Germany, but just because of his political opinion a bit for having uh, affiliated with the AFD, his bank account is being uh, closed. But there are other politicians who have committed war crimes, and this is one of the politicians that I despise with uh, passion, Kundaliza Rice. She says uh, recently she was in Hoover Institute and she's giving a lecture to political science students. I don't know what knowledge she's sharing with them, but she says Russia is a declining power ruled by a homicidal maniac who surrounded himself with idiots and drunks. Take a look. Uh, it's a diplomatic charm offensive, but the underlying circumstances of trying to supplant the United States in uh, the Indo-Pacific in particular, and per perhaps globally, continues to dominate uh, Chinese foreign policy. So you have a, a declining power in Russia that's disrupted the system through a war in Europe that nobody ever thought we'd see another ground war in Europe. You have a rising power or a risen power in China that's disrupting the system because it's kind of not playing by the rules that we thought uh, it would play by. And so all of a sudden, the United States finds itself with rivals. Now, let me say just wor one word about the relationship between the two of them. Because the other piece of this has also been, of course, the relationship without limits between Hu Jin, uh, between uh, uh, Zhang, uh, between uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, the bromance between these two uh, authoritarians. So um, let's start with the fundamentals. Uh, this is an anti-American, anti-Western axis. Is what it is. Uh, it has very little in shared beliefs, values, except that the West is decadent uh, and uh, civilization needs to be saved by China and Russia. It has very little in common except that it's both a revanchist China, the restoration of China, of which Taiwan is, of course, the last piece, Russia, the restoration of the uh, Russian Empire, so it's kind of 19th century in both cases. But nothing that binds them culturally. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there are no more xenophobic people in the world about Asians than the Russians. And so the underlying uh, of this is, is, a, is somewhat weak. So what you're talking about though, is that there's some benefit to being able to jointly uh, deal with, with the United States. But here's the problem. If you're Xi Jinping, and at the Olympics, so let me tell you, I think I know how that conversation went at the Olympics. Um, you know, I've got to do this thing in Ukraine. Uh, it'll take five or six days. You know what it's like because you've got Taiwan. Fine. Just don't do it until the Olympics are over. <laughs> I think that's, that was the conversation between them. And now Xi Jinping finds himself wedded to a homicidal maniac who's, pushed, who's launched a war in Europe, sanctions all over the place, and oh, by the way, who can't even control his own government and, and the crazy people around him. Uh, by the way, I know those people around him, so uh, I've never met Prigozhin, although I was at a number of dinners which he apparently catered. Um, he's, he's, he's just evil, right? Uh, then there's Patrushev, um, who's evil and kind of stupid, and according to most uh, people, sort of tied to the Chinese because that's how he made his wealth. And then there's the defense minister, Shoigu, who is just an idiot. All right, I, I spent a lot of time with him. He's really an idiot. And then you have Gerasimov, who apparently just drinks a lot. So it's not a particularly um, it, uh, inspiring group around Vladimir Putin, who is more and more isolated 
told the truth less and less. And now, um, as Bill Burns said, it's something I was recently at, the, our CIA director, uh, if, if the emperor had... Guys, uh, I mean, put my personal emotions and my opinion uh, about Condoleezza Rice aside. With complete objectivity, what the hell? Like, what is this? Like, she... Okay, you you despise Russians, etc. But you you call them all idiots. Imagine that if all this the foreign min, the, if if the defense minister is an idiot, Prigozhin is an idiot, Putin is an idiot, and all these people are idiot, and they you you couldn't and and still up until this moment you were not able to defeat them. So if they were smart, what could have happened? Like this is this type of uh, talk, this type of statements, this type of rhetoric. It's. Uh, it's not first diplomatic, and secondly, uh, it shows how immature, irrational, and unprofessional are these people who were in positions of power. She was the Secretary of State between, I think, 2005 and 2008 or 2009. She was with George W. Bush, right? And I do remember her very well. And believe me, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, people despise her with passion, and they they know that she is a bloodthirsty, warmonger uh, person. And I would like to bring your attention to just one example of this Gondaliz Arise. When in 2006, Israel invaded Lebanon and they killed over 1,200 civilians, only the civilians in, in Lebanon. This is what Gondaliz Arise said. I will show you. So this is from 2006. She, Rice sees bombs as birth pangs. Condoleezza Rice has described the plight of Lebanon as part of the birth pangs of a new Middle East and said that Israel should ignore calls for ceasefire. Only a human freak can equate the destruction of, the, of a country and the murder of hundreds of civilians with the birth of a child. Only a freak and only a monster can equate between them. So if there is somebody who is a maniac here, a sociopath and a psychopath, it's these people. It's people who are like uh, Condoleezza Rice and her colleagues in the United States and in other places around the world. These people have caused so much pain, inflicted so much pain and destruction in other countries. And then they compared the destruction to the birth of a child. Because she said, this war in Lebanon, it will be the beginning of the, the new Middle East, right? Because the United States wanted to create the, mid, the new Middle East. Remember, in 2001, they, and they want to war against Afghanistan. Uh, according to, from what we know, General, General Wesley Clark, they wanted to invade seven countries in five years, and Lebanon was one of them, right? And in 2006, Syria opened its all warehouses, military uh, stockpiles to Lebanon, and Lebanon defeated Israel, and Israel had to withdraw from Lebanon again in 2006. And they have never forgotten that. And that is why in 2011, they came for revenge from Syria. This is one of the reasons why they wanted to change the regime in Syria, right? This is one of the reasons for the CIA engineered regime change war in Syria. If you don't know these examples, guys, you would think that it just happened spontaneously. There was a revolution and then they started carrying arms because they wanted to defend them. No, this was all planned. This was all engineered by the CIA and they had their own reasons because they had their own grievances and they wanted to take revenge from Assad for supporting the Hezbollah in Lebanon in 2006 who defeated the Israelis. This is the truth of the matter. And speaking of Assad, guys, yesterday, as you may know, many of you already watched it. I translated uh, the interview of President Bashar Assad with the Chinese uh, state TV. I added English subtitles and I posted it. So you can watch this video. Uh, it's the previous video. Please uh, check it on my YouTube channel or on Rumble. I truly appreciate it because I have uh, worked on it for two days to bring this uh, English translations. And some people ask me, why do I add English subtitles to Assad's speeches or Assad's interviews? Because one of the reasons why the United States was able to sell the regime change war in Syria as um, a battle against evil because is because they were uh, uh, they portrayed Assad as a genocidal maniac. This is irrational person, you know. 
That's why I translate and add subtitles so that you guys judge. Like if you think after watching this interview, he's a psychopath, he's a genocidal maniac, and he's everything that the media says, okay, good, this is your opinion. But if you watch it and then see that there is a difference between what the media portrays and what this guy is saying and how is he acting and what he thinks and believes in, then um, uh, this would be a change in 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 in, in your opinion, which uh, is one of the reasons why I created Syriana Analysis because I want to uh, also uh, influence people's opinions so that we can reach a common ground between the East and the West and we can coexist together. So, guys, this was the live stream of today. It's already 55 uh, minutes uh, for the live stream. I apologize in advance for at the beginning if there was some sound glitches. I will check it again, and I'm really trying. If it doesn't work, it seems it's from the laptop, so I have to buy a new laptop because I tried everything. And uh, therefore, if you want to support my independent work, you can become a patron, and there are different means in the description below. It's I, I highly appreciate it. I thank you all, guys, for your great support. I'm receiving new patrons uh, uh, after every live stream. It's a great help because it allows me to become full, uh, fully in, independent and uh, continue bringing you a content like this. One coffee per month from you to me, it's a great help. So thank you so much, and I will see you very soon.